All right, what's up, everybody? We are here for episode 10 of the Bullets, Barbells, and Barbecue podcast. We're going to do a little Q&A cover uh, all three, the Bullets, the Barbells, and the Barbecue. I got Mike with me as halftime, and Chris is here for two weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row. And we got a sound guy that's mute, so that should be really handy to have. How are you guys doing today? Good? Excellent. Lovely. Is he actually a mute? No, but he refuses to talk. I know. It's weird. Yeah. It's like having Coach X on here. About as fucking helpful. <laughs> All right. We're going to start with the, <laughs> the Q&A. Hopefully, it's interesting. Um, we got for training-wise, we do, you, uh, do you think people should train both stances on deadlift? Why or why not? I, uh, I'm if, a convention- if conventional is both, then yes. Yeah. I'm a conventional puller, which is God's way. I um, also pull conventional. Yeah. So we got three to none. Uh, but no, I think pulling both stances is good, especially with weak hips. Sumo is good um, to help bring up the conventional. And obviously, I think conventional helps tremendously uh, build leg drive for sumo, uh, especially pulling deficits on conventional. I was going to say, if you didn't pull sumo for a reason uh, that you might feel like it hurts or, or, or whatever, if you just pull deficits... And then conventional, right, in the same stance, I think that's that's okay. I think sumo only hurts because your mobility is bad. Agreed. I would agree with that. Yeah. So I think that's part of it. People are scared of it, and they're just bad at it. I was bad at it. That's why I never stuck with it. I always tried doing both. I was like, oh, I'm going to try to do sumo. Then I would suck at it, you know, and I'd be like, ah, it's just not worth I didn't feel like it was worth it to me, so then i just go back to, like Mike said, doing deficits and just pulling conventional. But sumo... I think would is probably more beneficial to help your squat than it would be to just doing straight conventional deadlifts. I mean, that, that's what, that's how I always thought about it. I mean, it definitely helps. It strengthens the hips. Plus, you're also going to get the adductors because you're so wide. But the problem is, I think people do sumo, and they don't do it correctly. Like you don't just widen your stance. You have to actually push your knees out and try to teabag the bar. You need to have your crotch as close to the bar as you can. To make it efficient. And sumo, I mean, I give it a lot of crap. But, I mean, people who pull sumo, if you do it right, you're like a, a real deadlift technician. Because that has to be perfect for sumo to work. Whereas conventionally, you can kind of pull like a fucking Neanderthal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just rip the bar off the floor. But sumo, to be good at it, and I've seen some really good sumo pullers. It's very smooth. Do you have a favorite sumo puller? Because I couldn't name one that I like. Because one of the most Im- sumo. Impressive sumo pullers. I mean, I gotta say, on regular, I thought Justin Grouse was one of the most impressive sumo pullers yeah. I ever watched. He could put his feet out against the plates. You know, that's different in gear, though, too, right? I mean, that that conversation can be quite different. It does change. That dude could put his feet out against the plates and still yeah. get in position. I might be dating myself here, but Sean Frankel used to pull sumo. You no, know, the same era. I mean, Justin. Yeah. Justin he, trained he from, a, he was from a Big guy. Iron Gym. He was a little guy. And he, you know, he was yeah. pulling like what seven. I don't remember what. I remember what he was at. I mean, yeah. Ed pulled like a modified sumo. He kind of yeah. had his it was a little closer stance. What did uh, Mick was conventional when he? He was no, in gear, Mick wasn't he? Mick sumo. pulled sumo. Yeah. Did he pull sumo? Yeah. Yeah. He was sumo. also a little guy that pulled a lot of weight. There's Mick a was, lot of guys. Mick Manley was strong overall. Yeah. You know the uh, difference with different variations of sumo, I think may be more beneficial than just pulling sumo. Uh, like the like your competitive stance to transition over to conventional. Like if you did like stiff legged sumo, just attack hamstrings differently. You know. Oh yeah, like you start that. doing like sumo RDLs, sumo yeah. stiff legs. Yeah. You can do the deficits. You can do sumo rack pulls. Um, you get a lot of that hip work, and like I said, and adductors because you're so wide. Whereas conventional, your adductors don't get near as much work in it, but you get like a massive amount of leg drive on conventional. Where you, um, when you're doing your own programming, or if you're just experimenting with it. You could always pull your competitive stance first and just play around with sets of five and just see how it works. It wouldn't hurt just doing more work in the gym. You no, know? and like I said, it'll increase your, your flexibility. Your hip flexibility, if you start working sumo and pull correctly, as your sets go, your hip mobility will get better and better. But And the range of motion is a lot shorter. So once you get oh, it up, yeah, I mean, that's why we say it, it's a cheater's a cheater yeah. stance is a joke. But but I think that it the lift starts off a lot slower too. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, if you're patient. used to yeah, if you're used to being real powerful on the conventional, 
I would mm-hmm. say on a sumo, it's going to be slow, but if you get sumo off the floor, then you're, you're gonna get probably going to yeah. get it. Whereas yeah. conventional, you're going to get to your knee and you might not get it. Mm-hmm. Sumo now, if you get off the floor and then your legs straighten out and you're bent over, you're probably not going to get it if you straighten your legs too fast. But if you pull it nice, smooth, I mean, you're I never had the mobility or could get the rhythm down to do pull sumo. And getting my crotch as close to the bar as possible was always an issue for me because it's probably my hip mobility, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's not comfortable because you're actually trying to push your knees. So the bar should actually drag on the, like, almost on the, like, your vastus medialis, the inside of your thigh is where the bar should drag. The inside, your inner head of your quad, the vastus medialis is where the bar should drag across. And the inside of your shin, if you're getting it anywhere else, you are not in the right position. I've seen also the argument of toes out or forward when you're pulling sumo. And I believe if your toes are out, it makes your lockout faster. It does, but it does require you to have better balance. Now that's or is that opposite? No, it's it, but you can't. You can only turn your toes out so far. If you sort of turn them out too far, like you get in like a plie stance, you have no balance then, right? Because you've made yourself too narrow. You're, you know what I mean? Your overall width. So you only need to turn them out like a forty-five. Yeah. Because yeah, if you go too far out, you have no balance. I've seen some guys that are further than that. You know, I mean, their toes are like I couldn't even. Yeah, but then if they do like a hard lockout, they're going backwards. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. But, I mean, I think that that sumo question, I mean, is similar to people. You can close and you can ultra-wide bench. It's the same idea. Yeah. Ultra-wide benches will help build. Yeah, you just have to train it. But people don't like to train things they're not good at. Mm-hmm. That's 100% of the issue. Yeah, um, this sucks. Like I said, when I was trying to do sumo, I was like, oh, this sucks. Couldn't nearly pull as much, and it hurt. So then I was like, yeah, let's go back to doing what I was doing before. Yeah. I, gave it a, I gave it, a you know, six weeks, and... Felt like I wasn't progressing at it, so then... Yeah, it's like I said, it's a very finesse lift. I do think, uh, I don't know how true this is, but depending on how you're built, it might just fit you better, right? I Yeah, like you talk about like your your like shin length, and then you start looking at like your torso length and your arm length. It can change a lot of that. I think somewhere online there's actually like a formula for that, for how like you measure your your body, and then you type it into this, and it'll tell you where you should stand and all that stuff. I kind of hate that shit, though. Yeah, because everyone's different, obviously. It's the same kind of thing with squatting. And like, sometimes lifting, whatever's you know. in your head, you will yeah. tell yourself you're better at it. That's true. The last thing I want somebody to tell me is, hey, I'm going to go deadlift, but wait, let me Google what I should do. <laughs> you know, like, let me get my formula out to see if I can do this one or not. Just, I think if just you're go just, try it. If you're just starting out, it might be something you could look into trying. But if you're already lifting, obviously you know where you need to stand, unless you're going to completely change your stance. And I've never been like, well, there's like people I've seen that can like, oh, that guy should be a sumo puller or this or whatever. And I'm like, I am not that person yeah. that can spot somebody a mile away and be like, that guy should pull sumo. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, that guy. I mean, I can be like, that guy looks fat. He's probably strong. Yeah. I think the most... Oh, by the way, this episode's uh, sponsored by Little King. <laughs> we did eat a lot of Little King before we started. I wish it was sponsored and they gave it just for free. I, I mean, half, it was free for half, Chris and I because Mike it. bought it. Yes, it was. Half of it, maybe. You're so weak. Partially sponsored. How do you, ha- you ate? Ha- oh yeah, that's right. You're gonna it's save got, it. Dude, for it's got tomatoes work. on it. It's gonna be fucking soggy. That's later. why I feel I took, sick. You know I took that shit off. Oh, that's right. You don't eat vegetables. You're right. Just meat. And that's cheese. probably the last time you had vegetables, wasn't it? Just now. No, I told you I ate those triscuits. That's like fucking wheat. And then I vegetable? fucking had a shit and still <laughs> when I ate them. <laughs> What'd you put on those triscuits? Nothing. Ridiculous. They had salt on them. Like right? cheese whiz. Oh, they're the flavored ones. Which what flavor? Um, cilantro lime maybe. Oh, that's why you. Oh, it is. That's why you shit your pants. That's true. I yeah. can't remember if they were. Or maybe they were dill. I don't know. But for everybody out there, um, Triscuits and Monster will make you have to shit your pants. That's just a study I've done the last two days, <laughs> <laughs> and both times I had to shit like instantly. But disclaimer: there's a lot of things that make bread shit its pants. That's also true. I've yeah. I have had to poop. Uh, my client was talking to me this morning about all the different places we've had to poop. I've pooped in a lot of places out of sheer emergency. Like bathrooms or just No bathrooms. In I've the never wild. shit I've never shit outdoors with no toilet paper. What? No. So I'm I've civilized. got a story for that. I might have to run to a bathroom. Mm. But I You've am, obviously never been hunting for an extended period of time then. No, I don't I don't hunt. Yeah. That's too much. I hunt at the grocery store. I'm successful every time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just bought a cow. We could talk about that uh, later after some Q and A though. Yeah, you bought it like a uh, quarter, uh, like quarter a fat girl. No. Oh. No, um, a heifer. I didn't buy a heifer. I bought a cow. That is a okay. Hmm. But no, yes, yeah, so I have. It was a. It was actually a lot of places that I've gone, 
Because somebody was talking about shitting in a small bathroom, and I was like, "Oh, yeah, at this place, this place, and this place have small bathrooms." So they're like, "Why have you shit in all those places?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Yeah, what you was know that, that? Don't uh, stop there. That liquor store had a tiny bathroom. Yeah, because it used to be, toy, used to be, a, it used to be a Toys R Us, and like I had a fucking, I had to do a wall squat because the door was in my face. Then I was talking about the time I had to take an emergency shit at a bar, and they didn't have Ooh. fucking the stall doors didn't lock shut, so you had to hold the door shut with oh, your hand man. while you were shitting. Yeah, oh, the air, every yeah. single airport just ever, leave it open. There's like this. There's like three inches of room in the airport bathroom stalls. I don't understand why they do. And that. you make eye contact with the guy oh, yeah. walking by. Like, hey, hey buddy, <laughs> you almost done in there? Just kind of pointing at you through the hole. I'm like, okay. Um, if you ever have to shit at Sawgrass, their bathrooms are pretty nice. Yeah, they are. I thought oh, about my, my client yeah. told me I should write a, ba- a book about reviewing bathrooms I've shit in. Mm. You know, I've been surprised in some places how nice the bathrooms are when I'm ex- expecting shit on the walls. And I go in there and it's like, this is, I'd eat off the floor. When I was a younger, rather rotund young man, I would go to West Roads Mall and I always would go for the Von, Von Mar bathrooms. Oh, Von Mar Mar has has great shitters, dude. It's in there shitting by yourself, got the whole room to yourself. Yeah. And you got own Did you door. ever hear gunshots at Von Mar? Not when I was there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that was a shitty deal. That was weird. That guy, uh, that kid's parents lived in my dad's neighborhood. Oh, really? And I was uh, in his, in my dad's basement, benching and curling. That's what you do when you're like 19 or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it was on the on the TV that Von Mar got shot up. And I'm leaving, and I'm going uh, back to I think it was in an apartment at the time. And I'm leaving the neighborhood, and I can't get out. And there's just police cars everywhere. And uh, by the time I got home. I found out that it was that guy's parents' house, and they were like ripping through all his shit and trying to see what was going on with him. Crazy. That is crazy. They do have nice bathrooms, though. Yes, they do. Yeah, I can imagine. Probably like brass and wood. And I think it's just all. It's very marbly, but you're very alone in there. It's yeah. not very busy. Like oh, does it echo like marble floors and it's kind of bounce off the wall? Yeah, there's like well, there's there. a, you go into the bathroom, and then the stall has like its own actual door. Oh, nice. Well, it's got a wood door, right? Yeah. Yeah. Its own door. Is it oak? I don't know. What, what do you think the nicest gas station bathroom you ever shit in, though? Mm. You know, uh, quick trips are usually pretty clean. Usually, usually, but Not, come and go is pretty nice. It depends on the quick trip. The older quick trips just have a single shitter. Yeah. So the newer quick trips, yeah. Like yeah. I think you can refill your soda in the bathroom at those. <laughs> I think. You might not want the ice is probably a little tainted. I think any new like gas station go to the bathroom is probably pretty decent. Yeah. That's always attractive. You know where you don't stop is a rest stop on off the interstate. That's risky business. I peed there. It it's dangerous. I peed there and I left your phone number on the wall, but I've just peed there. <laughs> it was already there. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I started calling it obviously, yeah. <laughs> and it came up as Mike. And I was is like, that oh, you, bro? Weird. <laughs> weird. <laughs> weird. I always call these numbers to see what's up. Hey, see where I can going? find a good time in town. Why is Mike's name popping up when I dialed this number? Yeah, just right away. That's super fucking weird. I didn't see that coming at all. Every bathroom between here and California got my name on it. <laughs> oh, and still, man. no luck. They won't even no. call. They won't even blindly call him. No, they won't. <laughs> hey, this is Mike. So if you are a sumo puller and you're going to squat down to take a shit in a gas station bathroom, you might not have the width to put your feet out to get down there, but if you pull conventional, you're used to a closer stance, and you could squat down better. Here's a real survey for you to try. Speaking of that, do you think sitting your feet wider or closer together helps it be a cleaner wipe? Uh, see, that's a real silence when you got to think about it. Cause, Wide, wider. Mm, no, because wider, do you think you're putting more like cheek pressure you know, like you're squeezing the turd, oh, where if you're in closer... Oh, here's something, though. Have you ever sat on one of those toilet seats that, like, pulls your butt cheeks apart? Yep. Yeah, I'm like, wow, this is kind of nice, actually. Do they a clean break on that one? Usually they have, like, they're <laughs> yeah, like uh, the old, like, 1970s with, like, the pad on them. Yeah. Like those yeah. nasty... Yeah, yeah, the vinyl. It's the vinyl yeah. seat. You get, like, yeah. Then you look back, and you're like, oh, it's a ghost turd. A clean break and everything. I'm yeah. out of here. Yeah, I don't know if... Uh, yeah. Do you think closer stance or wider? I think close stance, you would think. But that's I don't a, know. That's a good question. Are you... Because a squatty potty. Are you externally rotating your feet as you're wiping to get good engagement? It depends on how you train that day and how you feel. (laughs) So if you have to... And if you're right-handed and you can cleanly wipe left-handed, you are a hero. Oh, I can't. Oh, there's no way. I can't wipe left-handed. No. Yeah. If you're you're right-handed and you can wipe left-handed... Are you a crumpler or a folder? Dude, a crumpler. That's like a loofah, dude. Totally crumpling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what's, What's mute do? I want the most distance between my <laughs> hand and my ass. He asshole. folds. He said he, he folds. folds. Oh, he's got poop under his fingernails. You can tell. <laughs> oh, gross. Oh, man. Mm. I mean, that's an important question. That it, Well, it is. 
Yeah. That could probably make or break a relationship. I think so. Or like uh, creamy or crunchy peanut butter. Crunchy, obviously. It's crunchy. not even real peanut butter crunchy, if it's creamy. Definitely. I know. Creamy's not even real. It's it's like peanut paste. It's gross. Yeah. Mm. I, I just yeah, I just give it to your dog. It's gross. <laughs> That could have, We're uh, definitely going to go off topic. We yeah. start talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, have, no, but, have yeah. you ever pulled sumo in a? I've never com- contest. competitively pulled sumo. No. What about? Because I'm not good at it. No, I was really. I had a conventional deadlift suit, and I was fucking terrible in that thing. But conventional deadlift suits to me are really hard to pull in. They're very hard. Sumo gives you the ability to kind of maneuver to get down. You think that you, you can shift side to side to grab the bar? Oh yeah, I just it, I hate I hate grabbing the bar with that. Remember the first time I put it on, I was out here and it had like uh, two twenty five on the bar, and I couldn't even pull off the floor. I mean, it was you it have was, to use the bar to pull yourself in. Yeah, it, it was so difficult to figure out how to get down there, and then eventually, you know, five plus can move if you nail it right. But yeah. that, that was weird. No, I think I think sumo is definitely a good alternative if you pull conventional. And I think if you're conventional, I mean, if you're sumo, you should pull conventional. One, yeah, one thing though with conventional because your low back, your low back, and your leg drive will get so strong with conventional. Exactly. And another good deadlift for both of them are slow eccentrics. Yep. That'll make you super strong to be able to control that weight. Dropping the weight from the top at a high speed doesn't really benefit you at all. Unless it's it on looks TikTok. Cool. It looks yeah. cool, though. TikTok is pretty sweet. Yeah, it yeah. looks cool on your IG post, and then everybody the whole, in the gym can hear that you pulled 225. <laughs> <laughs> your, the whole building shakes, your phone falls over. 195, got it. Sick. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, slow eccentrics, and I think are, are on both of those stances are also good. Just they teach you positioning. Conventionals just build so many other things outside of deadlifting, though, in general, that I just, even if you suck at conventional and and you're not competing, just keep pulling conventional because everything else will get stronger. You'll Here's how I always looked at it with sumo and conventional. In real life, are you if you're going to pick something up, are you like, all right, let me get my feet real wide here, and then... Not ever. Actually, yeah. but actually, if you think about it, if you go to pick up an entertainment center, <laughs> in all honesty, I'm a conventional guy. Your feet will be wider than conventional to pick up an entertainment center. Yeah, that's no. Okay. I, mean, I, for, I think for yeah. most every you're not picking though. anything up that's heavy with your fucking feet only hip width apart. All right. Well, let's say you're doing. Let's say I let's, hate that argument because you're right. It is because you think about I it. Know. Okay, so let's do strongman training, right? How far are your feet apart if you're going to pick up a stone? Conventional ish. See. Yeah, but you also throw everything you ever learned about deadlift out the window when oh, you do stones. Stop it. Because you wrap your body around the stone. You do. And but you pick it up round back and I, set it in your lap. Yep. I still think that conventional is more suited for everyday Yeah, you can't life. pick up a stone sumo at all. There's just no way. You wouldn't be able to do it. No. But you also, have you ever tried to pick up a stone of, with regular deadlift technique with an arched back? Never. Exactly. I, not, not that, I always thought that arched back thing was kind of, eh. Like, I, my idea. back is super roundy when I deadlift. And I never, I've tried fixing it, and it's just like... That's I why you're not some, a good deadlifter. <laughs> We've talked about this before. <laughs> I think some people... Just have more of a rounded back when they deadlift. Sometimes, but you have to remember mm. the tighter your back is, the more it is for the weight to overcome. I'm not saying that it's r- like super arch. And you know, the more rounded your back is, the longer the pull is. Yeah. Free to get it locked out. But I'm talking like trying Which to get it. Which probably cuts off around like 501. Probably trying to get it completely <laughs> out of there. <laughs> <laughs> I think being as tight as you can, obviously, with any lift, I would say when you get to 90% above, you're going to get 90% and above technique. Exactly. But. With sumo, you don't have to worry about that as much with the rounded back technique. Um, it will make your pull weight longer on sumo. With sumo, you have a short amount of time to get that weight done. You start much more upright. That you don't really have. The idea is your hips and up, no matter conventional or sumo, should never change position from the time you start to the time you finish. Mm-hmm. Just your hips are moving. Yeah, but I think in sumo, generally, if everyone gets in that position, they're more at an upright position with their lower back as what as opposed to conventional sure. when they get down in their position. And I also think people I think sumo it's harder to get your, you know, your shoulders back when you're in conventional to not let your lower back round. But in sumo it seems like when you just drop it in that position you're already in that position. Sumo is also just Correct not me fun. If I'm wrong. It's, sumo, it's just not fun. It doesn't se- seem as fun. Everybody always calls you a cheater, but those guys are just haters because they can't deadlift as much as you as your in your sumo pull. I have seen really interesting correlations with uh, some like Chris Duffin can deadlift, you know, like what was like 900 for like six times sumo or whatever it was. But with that stupid fucking uh, deadlift party has, yeah, that everybody has gotten rid of now. I don't, yeah. I don't care for that guy. Um, 
tell us how you really feel. The, what's it, what I don't. I think shoes. I fucking met him. I think he's a knob. Uh, mm. Gosh, what, the bare, barefoot shoes or whatever. Yeah, like he invented those. I'm sure. But the thing is, what I was, but what I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> I get it. But the thing that I'm saying is that he could deadlift. You know, whatever it was, that's pretty high deadlift for a set of six. But if you went 50 pounds over that conventional, he couldn't move it. And if you took that deadlift bar away, he'd probably pull like 750. Uh, true. What was it? Super whippy? What's up? Yeah, it's super whippy. It's like an elephant. You pull the slack out of the fucking bar and it's like above your knees. Yeah. No, so you just got to get the weight off the ground like two inches. Just just fucking more weight on the bar, Mm. the easier it'll move. It's already Mm. been banned by most meats. Yeah. Mm. It looks cool, though. Yeah, they put it in a meat and all of a sudden everybody fucking pulled like 100 pound PRs and we're like, oh, shocker. My training was sick. Yeah. All my other lifts didn't even move when my fucking deadlift went up 100 pounds. I'm going to have to get one of those so I can feel better about myself. You ever benched? uh, I don't think you pull enough for it to matter. Mm. Ouch. It's not nice. <laughs> uh, but he's I pull athlete. weekly, thank you. Did you just pull this week? No, I told you my back is hurting this week. Oh, because you have because you're week. round back when you pull coming back. <laughs> 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 no, uh, I, see I, everybody problem solved itself. I slept funny, thank you. I hurt my uh I, I hurt myself. But mm-hmm. my bicep kinda got really funky last week. I was deadlifting the axle and with straps even and it really pulled on my left bicep in a weird way. And I, I was so worried that I just tweak something. Oh, like like tore it on the tit on the oh, edge freaked of tearing me out, man. So that's another good question. So mixed grip, straps, or hook grip? Uh, all, I am a it. pussy. I cannot hook grip. I can't either. I've tried I have fat, so many and times. And I also kind of have fat sausage hands on the bar. I used to always do mixed grip, but I would when I would get heavy, I would always be afraid that my underhand was going to pop my bicep every time. Yeah, I would always, it, I, it was always in the back of my mind. I do always suggest to anybody, do all your warm-up sets, double overhand, because it's like free grip training. Yeah. Agreed. Yep. Pull up until a weight that you might not be able, that you think you're, don't miss a weight because you're trying to train your grip, then go your over-under or your yep. it, hook grip. And just because you can pull hook grip, you shouldn't pull hook grip all the time. You still need to pull just regular double overhand Agreed. to strengthen your grip. Yeah. Because you should work up and then try to set a double overhand PR. Yep. Hey, cool. You know, this week I pulled 315, double overhand, you know, before I had a switch. Mm-hmm. And that's just, that's literally like two exercises in one. I think if you can pull hook grip, you should pull hook grip because the oh, odds no, on I you think hurting yourself are Because you don't less. have the underarm with the yes. bicep on the twist. Yeah. But even, it, like I said, if you can hook grip, I think your warm-up sets still pull double overhand without the hook grip just to work your grip training. Agreed. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. grip training is always going to be something in life you will use. So, uh, in Strongman, I'll always take advantage of straps at a show. Because your hands are strong. Well, there's always grip events, too. Mm-hmm. You've seen my grip. He does have a great pinch grip. So Was this the, earlier or before the show or what? All the time. A couple weeks oh. ago. Yeah. But then uh, I just... That's how those well, there, so the, the thing is, though, that there's different didn't positions. I outro- didn't I outrolling thunder you? Yeah. And there, but, there, but, but big time. Oh, yeah? And I, oh, never, yeah. And big, I, don't, and I haven't trained grip you since... you have one of those? Yeah. Yeah, here. I haven't trained grip since, like, 83, though. Yeah, it's really it's really weird <laughs> in the basement. Of here. But what I, what I was what I was gonna say is that I'll always take advantage of the equipment at a strongman show, but and but I always have a switch grip if I compete powerlifting, right? I mean, mm. I'll, I always do, and I'll even if it's a slight risk, if it's in your head, I'll take the risk if at a meet just for the pull. You know, yeah, I mean, outside I mean, of hook grip, I mean, switch mix grip is like the most superior grip you can have outside of hook, obviously. Yeah. But I think it does. But I just it hurts so bad. It does a little something weird to the bar when you get heavy, though. Like it'll. What does I, the the mixed grip? You'll helicopter like, uh, a little bit. Yes, yeah. that's exactly. Because what usually it your underarm, yeah. especially if you train a lot, your underarm. Because most of us who train a lot probably can't straighten your arm all the way anyway because mm-hmm. your bicep tight or tightness. Mm-hmm. So your one arm is shorter. So you will always helicopter. Yeah, a you little can, bit. You pick that up mm-hmm. in a video, and you're like, "Ooh, fuck!" You know, damn. Yeah. Looks yeah. nasty. And, it, it, and then here's the crazy part: you ever try to switch your grip? I, that's super awkward. The I don't yeah, even. I've tried to because when I thought my when I was doing hook grip a lot and I thought my right bicep was feeling weird, I tried doing my left left hand under and it was not. That's like wiping the same. your ass with the other hand. Exactly. Yeah, it feels super awkward. Mm. That would be weird. But overall, I'll try in, it. Try overall, it. in in conclusion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> overall, in conclusion, yeah, I think you should always train both. But that's like I said with any lifts: close stance, sta- close stance squats, wide stance squats, ultra wide bench, close grip bench, competition bench. Um, even the sumos, you can pull a modified grip or modified sumo, yep. wide stance. Train all your stances because when you bring up all those, yeah, you just get strong. You're just gonna get stronger and yeah. stronger. It's it's training from all angles. The same people that, you know, will only pull sumo will do you know 47 different sets of curls to hit their bicep in every different direction. Yeah, you know what I mean. So yeah. I think train all the angles of it 
I mean, there's you can take one lift with a barbell and probably come up with six different variations Obviously. easily yeah. of ways to train it. Like even Mike said, RDLs, sumo deadlifts. Or, I mean, sumo RDLs, sumo stiff leg deadlifts, any of that stuff. Anything you do with a close stance, do with a wide stance, do with a medium stance, toes in, toes straight ahead. Train them all, especially if you're not training for a meet. Now, if you get into meat prep, you need to fucking start narrowing that yeah, shit down pick, to what you're going to do. Yeah. And then slowly, if you're doing both, a couple of weeks out, just quit doing the alternative and just recover, right? You know, like I have people who do, they might pull deficits uh, if they're conventional, but if they're a sumo puller, I'll have them pull conventional instead of their deficits. I think that's br- it's brilliant, yeah. Then you pull both in your... Because, I mean, conventional is like an extreme sumo deficit, mm-hmm. if you really look at it that way. I think if you don't want to pull sumo, though, and you pull conventional... You need to definitely put in deficits for sure. Yeah, and I was the strongest ever when I did a lot of deficits. And don't be a pussy and still try to pull sumos. Even lightweight, you don't have to fucking pull. Just the mobility you will help in your hips. Yeah, it's good. Do you pull sumo? I do pull sumo sometimes. When? Well, when was the last time you pulled sumo? Go ahead. We have to remember, I only deadlift once every three weeks. Oh yeah, see, doesn't deadlift enough. Uh, <laughs> fun fact, pretty effective. Came in here and they were pulling against those thicky gray bands uh, probably uh, a month ago. Those ones you had to the front that almost pulled you over? Not those ones. The ones back at the platform. Oh, uh, yeah. That day. It was over 650 with band tension and stuff. I mean, it was no joke. And it was casual, which was upsetting. When I, uh, yesterday, when I uh, deadlifted in here, just because my bicep, I was just like, I'm not going to wear my belt or anything and I'm going to like just stop early. And I was still using straps. And I pulled 500 without a belt and with a fucked up bicep. And it felt like I felt accomplished because he never wears a belt. That and was a question. That was a question about why I never wear a belt. <laughs> well, and excuse me. I, that's nothing. There's no reason, really. I just never did. I wasn't like, I'm a fucking badass and I'm never going to wear a belt. You know, I did a few. I would joke around with people, but I don't know. I just, belts have never been comfortable to me. The only time I wore a belt was when I competed in multiply to hold my gear in place. Yeah. To hold my briefs in place with my suit. Like why cinch, cinch down just enough that it could hold it, but not for Hold support. it in place, yeah. yeah. Why Why do you only deadlift every three weeks? Um, I get too beat up as an elder in the sport. I mean, I'm 41, but in powerlifting years, I think I'm like 407. Yeah. Moses, I mean, knock Moses on wood, I've been lucky. I've never had any like major injuries. I've never knock on wood, torn everything. I've had some partial tears. I've never had you anything. Your pec What'd you do you? on the incline bench when I was partially here? Partially tore my bicep tendon. Okay, so I partially tore my pec. <laughs> but I've never had to like surgically yeah. mm. have to do anything. Um, I've always been, and not that this is against anybody, obviously, because everybody knows my stance. I've always been a drug for the lifter. And so recovery, especially as you get older, to pull heavy on squats and deadlifts in the same week gets harder and harder, Fuck, I yeah. think, in your recovery. Plus just like, you know, life stress, whatever. This isn't making an excuse for me because I still do it. So I rotate squats, deadlifts, good mornings every three weeks. And I feel like good recovery. You know, the thing and is a lot of that training overlaps. Yeah. You know what I mean? Squatting yeah. and deadlifting train a lot of the same things anyway to an extent, right? And then you just have to do the right accessories. You know but what I mean? You're Pick skilled right enough to be able to. And I've been in the game long enough, exactly. yes, to, yeah. to do that, that I'm not going to. I don't think that's feel. a suggestion for dudes that are in their 20s, uh, men and women. No, if you're new to it, starting. you need the yeah. technique work over and over. I mean, just I've keep been, hammering, yeah. I mean, I did my first powerlifting in like 2006 or something like that. So Obviously, I've been around I'm and seen some things. Giving you a hard time because I do deadlift every week, but I'm also older, but I don't deadlift heavy anymore because, once again, I can deadlift every week if I don't deadlift heavy. And Brett's obviously stronger than I am, so he did lifts every three weeks. And well, and I'm in the old school. I'm still in the mentality. Yeah. I've always trained like conjugate or west side for the mm-hmm. most part. I did simple my simple strength program too. I ran that. I ran that. Obviously, I tested it before I ever put it out. But I just like to pull singles and triples. You know, if you're going to pull heavy weight like that, and you're going to put your body under load as you're getting older, to me, that is a way to modify your training and still benefit from it. My deadlifts built over singles over the last year and a half. That's it. I mean, you look at you Louis know. Simmons. He always said, if you're pulling triples, you're dogging at the first two to get the third one. Mm. And like Dave Tate was just talking about in a podcast the other day, he's like, you know, I've always trained singles. I'm probably, knock on wood, I'm not going to get hurt pulling singles because my body's conditioned to a single. There's a ton more room for error if you start doing like sets of five and stuff. And you're we start getting sloppy. Yeah, yeah, you get all over the place. I think Mike and I have talked about this before. I That's when I get hurt is if I'm even pulling lightweight and I'm pulling reps, five, you know, yeah. fives, you yeah. know, fourth, fifth rep. Oop. Tweaking well, back. and I think because oh, people, oh, they see lightweight, you know, yeah. they see lightweight and they just like, f- like fuck around with it. They're just like, oh, you know, 
whatever, it's 225. I can just slam this around. But then you talk to that, you talk to people who get hurt, who lift all the time, like, oh, no, dude. I was like twisted to pick up a bag of fucking cat litter. My fucking <laughs> back went out. It's not, you know what I mean? So that same thing can happen yeah. in the yeah. gym when you're just like, oh, I'm just fucking warming up. What's it matter? I'm like, dude, that's like my nephew when he used to work with me at the gym. And I was like, he would start benching. He'd just like throw a plate on. I was like, dude, how about like the fucking bar? You know what drives me insane? The bar, 95. You know what I mean? Like I know. I I I do that still. I I I mean that those guys that were squatting, you know, a thousand pounds like at Westside, they'd start with a bar and a twenty five and a plate. And yeah, a plate same people like half, and, I've you know. seen a lot of great benchers and they're they're doing maybe a couple sets of twenty with the bar. Then they're I don't know like why you quarter. wouldn't do that. Like it's not cool now they're, just to their put their jumps a plate will, on there. their jumps will speed up. Now they're probably going plate quarter, plate quarter. Their yeah. jumps are different than yeah. but just it, with that's that's another good point. Just take your time. You gotta get warm. You gotta get really warm. And on up. the belt thing, I just have I, I've you can, I think people rely too much on belts. I think they rely way too much on it, and a lot of people don't even use a belt correctly. Mm-hmm. You know, you should be able to fit your hand inside the belt, mm-hmm. take a deep breath into your stomach, that inner abdominal pressure tighten up against it, and you should feel like you're pooping kind of. That's why those those lever belts I think are at a fault for some people because they get them so tight. Yes. And they can't breathe into it. Yes, you need to breathe into it, and then tighten up so your body's still using it. But you should train without the belt a lot. Yeah. To build that core stability. Like, and this is no like weird arrogance pitch, but I have never like missed a squat because, oh, my abs caved and I went forward. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I've always had like a weirdly strong back, but I've always trained a lot of back stuff. So when I, uh, when I got a belt, I, I still have the same belt that I had when I first started powerlifting. Of course, the notches, I'm at the tail end of it, but. Because uh, you're learning how to get fat now? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, I got a single prong belt and I remember the coaching on that from a friend of mine was just like, don't get a multi prong, dual prong belt. Don't get a lever belt because then there's more shit to fuck with out of meat. You know, it's really simple with a single prong belt. Right. So I would use that still have the same one and, uh, and strongman, I, I use it mostly for log work to build up a bigger belly to rest a log on a clean to help sure. my clean. Yeah. And there's no rules, right? So I, you can totally do that. So in fact, I'll wear two. I'll wear a soft belt under my regular belt to be wider. Uh, but in powerlifting, I still, I do direct weighted ab work uh, to be stronger, to have a thicker midsection. And, and I have to do more than I think probably you do because I do wear a belt more than you do. Mm-hmm. So I have to do uh, – one of my favorite things is like like in a squat stance, standing with a rope, like pull-downs, crunches, standing up. It's sure. one of my favorite things to do. One of the big things people look like those obliques. Obliques are huge for your stability, especially when you're walking walking with weights. Farmers, yeah. Farmers, just like oblique crunches. Yoke. Yeah, any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, training your core to be strong. And again, I'm not sure I made that wears a belt because tons of people wear belts and are super strong. Belts are obviously proven. I've just – that's just my own personal thing. And now it's probably just such in my head they're so uncomfortable to me that I don't care for them. They bind me up like when I deadlift. Yeah. Any of that stuff. But train without one. Yeah. Build up your core strength. I agree. Build your and core if strength. If you up. are going to use a belt, use it right. Like you said, you got to get that deep, yeah, use it, deep use it belly right. breath. You got to suck in, you know, deep belly breath to push all that weight, all it out against your belt so you can feel it. Yeah. And then tighten you up a belt? against the belt. I do wear it. Even belt. when you're not doing heavy deadlifts? Only when I'm doing heavy, I wear the but belt. But you don't pull heavy. I, I I don't Maybe pull as heavy as I yeah I don't pull as heavy as I used to but I mean I'm still I'll still pull in the fours and I'll but if it feels like it's ninety percent you have a belt on yes okay yes. have you tried pulling heavy With, high fours without a belt um no because I've always had a belt I've always used the belt so I think it's in my head that I need the belt sure I'm afraid I'm gonna get hurt if I don't wear the belt that's thing with some yeah. people like I said I'm I'm not shunning the belt don't be like. Man, I can not wear. Yeah, if you're used to wearing a belt, wear one. But use it right. But also, off season, try to train without it all the time. Yep. Who cares if you have to drop your squat or deadlift like forty pounds? But it'll it'll come back. You'll be stronger. I don't wear it until I get up to my top two sets, though. And and, and that's kind of the exactly misconception wrong. too. I think people think all powerlifters are fat. We joke around about it a lot. Mm-hmm. But those dudes have thick midsections. Yeah, they're just like, wider. They're yeah. solid. But you're, if you're gonna walk out big weights, yeah. I mean, you can you can look at CrossFitters, guys and girls, and they have a thick midsection. Yeah. But obviously, powerlifters, a lot of them carry more body fat. I'm not going to disagree. Yeah. You know, whatever, right? But a lot of it's just a thick. It's, it's a literal power. Yeah. And not just fat. It's like it's literally yeah. Yeah. just a thick midsection from the training they've done. Strongman, 
And that can obviously, obviously they can always I mean, lean out. I'm not saying they can't. If you look at Eddie Hall, he's got a big gut, but it, he has not even right, when he, he has, not he has, right now. But he has though. abs. Damn. But right even now, yeah. he's well, that's great. what I would joke. You know, 120 pounds with abs isn't as impressive as 280 with abs. Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah, he's three time. something. Yeah, with he's abs, yeah. You know, so yeah, for sure. You know, if yeah. I wake up and I turn the lights off in the bathroom and I look in the mirror, I have abs. Like yeah. my shoulders and traps look decent in the dark. <laughs> yeah, I look no, just with some te- just some TV light. You're like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. That, TV like TV light behind you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Man, I look good in this TV light right now. Yeah, hey, this TV light. Hey, come here, look at this, babe. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I can't come out there. <laughs> I got to shave my back for the summer. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've been cleaning the pool out, getting ready. You know, I was in Silky's cleaning it out the other day. It's I'm on the tail end of it. Were you when you had your Silky's with the neighbors throwing up? Probably. Yeah, I bet yeah. I would be. But I'm so pasty right now, and the the bat and all the all the fuzz is dark, so it's disgusting. And as the sun comes out, it gets bleached. It's or you? It's me. That's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> got, oh man! Got, got to shave her up. What's the next question? Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the importance of uh, gun knowledge and safety. You know, you got the constitutional carry stuff that passed in Nebraska. It's passed in like 26 or 27 states now. And obviously, we've talked about it a little bit of it before. Matt and I talked about it. Um, there, just because uh, me and these guys are probably have the same thought process being as far as pro gun, does not mean we're pro gun stupidity. And just because you can carry a gun doesn't mean you should carry a gun if you don't have the slightest fucking clue what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So Chris has got some decent knowledge on the gun situation, so I'll kind of let him kind of take the run on this one. If you're, plan- if you're new to carrying a gun, the first thing you need to do is go and get some actual training in how to manipulate the firearm, how you should carry the firearm, where you're comfortable carrying the firearm, and a proper holster for the firearm. And don't be out in public, like, showing it to your friends, you know. You, not everybody needs to know you have it. You know, just, like, don't pull it out, and it's not show and tell time in public to, put, you know, show everybody your new gun that you got. Well, it's kind of like I've always said. If, yeah. you're, if you're concealed carrying properly, no one should know you have a gun. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I think everyone who purchases a gun, I'm 100% about the constitu- constitutional carry thing, but I think that a responsible gun owner, if you never owned a gun before, and you want to be a responsible gun owner, you should definitely get some formal training on how to use it properly. Yep. Because the last thing you want to do is leave Cabela's or Shields or wherever you get your new gun. You're like, yeah, this is awesome. You got some ammo for it. You load it. You put it in your, you know, you put it in your jeans or whatever, and you shoot yourself in the leg because you don't know what you're doing. Or you know? if you're an idiot with a gun, you just gave the other person a gun. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And you then, know, one of the things I did when I, uh, st- so when I started to have guns more in the open with the kids was I took it in, uh, apart in front of them and, and de, de, uh, like mystified what they were. Their tools, right? I you know, walked through that stuff, and I was racking it pretty hard and kind of showing them, like, you can lose a finger, right? Let alone shoot yourself. But, like, all I mean, it's harsh mechanics. It's not a toy, right? And I was showing them. And always assume it's dangerous. Absolutely. So taking them apart, putting it back together, showing them like what it was, so they'd be a little bit more familiar. And obviously, I'm still locking them up and carrying them appropriately, but showing them with the kids at our house. It's pretty much like if you guys, we don't leave guns out in the open because you know they're little kids and they're curious. Obviously, yep. you know. But if they're they're told if you see it, if you see it out in the open, you don't touch it. You tell one of us like, hey, this is there. It shouldn't be there, or you know anything like that, and then. But they also they also need to know the gun safety too. You know, I think that's also a big yep. deal at proper times. You know, not when it's just they're home by themselves and somebody left one on the table accidentally and they forgot about it. You know, they need to be shown like proper ways to handle them once they get old enough to do that too. If they're going to be around the house and if there is a scenario to where they may need to use it to protect themselves if someone breaks into the home. You know, as teenagers or something like that. There's plenty of stories about that online yeah. too. That these you know. Um, the concealed carry course that was in uh, Omaha, I had to like redo this thing like a few years back, and they had a story about a kid that was like 12 years old. Bad guy breaks in the house. He took his like three or four siblings with him into a closet where dad said to go with this rifle. If anybody ever does that, 
and he's sitting there with his loaded rifle, put with door closed, right, pointing outward, and the guy goes in the thing to check if there's like valuables in there, and he turned around and ran because the kid had a gun. Right, kid didn't shoot him, right, but he was ready to, and his siblings were behind him, and they're all very young. I mean, to your point, they knew what it was for, responsibly, and saved those kids, right? And that yeah, just. So the kids, if you want your kids to know the proper way to use a gun, if you yourself are buying a gun and you're new to it, you yourself should be know the proper way to use a gun, and that's what I'm saying yeah. by oh yeah, getting some training, go to some classes, you know, get it, do the right right thing. Make sure you have somewhere proper to lock the thing up too, not like a bookshelf or something that you're gonna hide. You Brett, where do you put your guns? guns? Well, I don't have Turin, <laughs> <laughs> but my guns are also not out in the open though either. You have them mounted on the wall. I do have some guns hanging <laughs> on my wall, <laughs> all of which are unloaded because I was told but that collectors. I could not have <laughs> loaded guns on the wall. <laughs> and on that aspect, so I am a little bit of a gun collector. I enjoy cool guns. But we talked about this earlier before we started podcasting. The one that I keep in my nightstand is the gun that I've handled the most and I've shot the most and I feel the most comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Now, any of the other guns... I mean, I've been around guns enough. Any of the other guns, sure. If I needed to do something with them, I would have no problem with that. Like, if they raid my house and I make it to my gun safe, be ready. But my point was, any gun that you have in close reach, if you're looking for protection, whether it's a gun you carry or a gun you choose to defend your house with. And remember, defend your house does not mean, I, this guy is annoying and he's in my front yard. I'm going to fucking blast this dude. That's not what I'm talking about. Someone comes into your house directly threatening you and your family is is a different scenario. Yeah. To cause you or your loved one's bodily harm. Yes. yes. Now, yes. that gun needs to be a gun that you could operate. I'm not saying you got to be able to hang upside down and take it apart before you get a nosebleed, like major pain. <laughs> but it should be a gun that you are 100% comfortable with handling. It doesn't it's, matter if it's a 22, 380, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. It doesn't matter. You ask the guy that got shot with a 22 15 times, they got shot with a 9 15 times, he's not going to tell you one hurt less than the other one. Yeah, it's neither, just whatever you're comfortable with. Neither one, and you know what? And you and you hope if somebody comes in your house and and you draw down on them and you tell them, you know, get out of my house or I'm going to shoot. You know what I mean? You hope they just fucking leave. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's the most the outcome most often they would. For, that's right? the outcome yeah. you're looking for. Yeah, that's yes. the outcome you're looking for. No one, no one really wants to shoot anybody. You know what I mean? Uh, but obviously, take what you're comfortable with and that you could operate. And obviously. Get a gun that you know is going to be reliable. And that's when it comes down to doing a little bit of research before you buy a gun. What's your favorite piece? I think reliable is also relative. You need to go out and shoot it. Then you should. You know before you buy reliable. a gun, go, yes. to a, go to a range, rent a bunch of different guns, try them out. Mine, uh, I have a Springfield XT40 that was I've had forever. It's super comfortable for me. It's always been reliable for me, and I would feel... That's your nightstand? Well, there's three in my nightstand, so there's an array of things. But You have a judge. I have a tourist judge that I keep yeah. around in case I'm not there and Amber's by herself because you can just, I mean, that shoots 410 shotgun rounds, so your accuracy yeah. can be a lot less. Yeah. And then I have, there's another gun that's in there, but that's a small one I carry. Like sometimes a little double tap. It's like a little Derringer style gun. Mm-hmm. It's just in there because if I carry, sometimes I'll carry that. Like in gym shorts or something? Whatever. It's really tiny. Yeah. But I can carry it however. It's got yeah. inside the pants holster for it. But my, my go-to would be my, if, you know, life or death, someone's in my house, my Springfield XD is the one that I'm the most comfortable with. Everybody's going to be different. You know, like Chris said, it doesn't matter if it's a, you have a an old twenty two revolver your dad gave you and you've shot a million times, but you know the ins and outs of that gun. Great. Pull that out. There's something uh, primitive about like a snub nose six shooter that I feel like I want to start carrying instead of what I do carry. Yeah. The nice things about revolvers are most times if you're going to get into an altercation with someone, you know, semi-autos will go out of battery and if you have it pressed up against somebody. Yes, that the is revolver, true. Matt and I talked about oh, yeah. yeah. The revolver you can, will not go by out, out of battery. Let's, buy, let's dumb it down a bit. Out of battery means if the you push it into somebody's slide, is back. If the slide moves a yeah, little not, bit. Yeah, not them. double A's, by the way. Yeah. Like, uh, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the slide moves a little bit. The trigger is frozen, so the trigger will not move. That's, so, a, that's a great point. Yeah. So, so a revolver, you can jam it deep in. Unless you have a semi-auto that you put a compensator or something on that will not move the slide out of yeah. battery. Sure. We're and getting I, a little bit more into, like, Customize, customization yeah, here. But for the only thing about revolvers, though, is they're going to have like a 12-pound trigger. You know, you're not going to be able to shoot that thing very accurately, accurately unless you have a lot of 
experience with it. But for something up close and if you're going to be in like a scuffle with somebody, that's the one that you aren't, want. Aren't most engagements like 7 to 14 feet? Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, but most, I think that's like a law enforcement statistic, you know. But exactly, like yeah. most Most people that are, if you're going to get into like an altercation with somebody, they're going to be on top of you. Mm. You know, that's probably what's going to, if unless you, unless you are in your house and you're like already set up, you know, and someone's coming for you, you know, you know, they're coming, then you're going to have a little distance. But if you come out of the house and you're searching your house and you run across somebody and they kind of get a little bit of a drop on you and then you're in a scuffle, you know, if you that's have a, a revolver, point, yeah. you're going to be able to just press it somewhere and pull the trigger. You yeah. know, it, it won't go out of And I'll throw it on the revolver thing. I bought a little Ruger LCR. If you know those are, it's like the tiny, like a subcompact with mm-hmm. a J-frame. There's no hammer on it. Yeah. Um, I had bought one of those for Amber. But now, for women, especially like my wife has smaller hands, the revolver was not that great for her. The revolver, One thing with the revolver, a downside, it does have a lot more recoil to it mm-hmm. because it, there's no slide it's mechanic fixed. to yeah. release some of the pressure as the round comes back. So that might take some of the comfort level out. So if you're going to buy, like, I'm going to buy a gun for my wife, and look at this cute I little mean, revolver. They make 22 yeah, revolvers, too. They so do. They do. But can, if, you, if, you're, mean, if you're set on, like, a 9 or something like that, yeah. or, or hers was, like, a 38 special, um, a revolver is not n- always necessarily the most comfortable gun for a female mm-hmm. because there is a lot of recoil coming back to that gun. I'm just throwing it out there as something to think about. Oh, no, you 100%. Know, I, I don't own a revolver myself, but I'm just, you know, putting it out there as more... A little bit of something to think about if you. I mean, it seems like a very of, like detective thing to have, you know, like back in the day, Columbo yeah, and yeah, whatnot. Got the, the snub nose revolver. Yeah. yeah, or a mobster thing. Yeah, the twenty two. What do you, uh, 22 what do you carry mobster? around the table, Chris? What do you carry? I carry a forty eight X every day. That's what I carry with a an Glock on it. A Glock. Yeah. How about you, Brett. Uh, my carry is a Smith Wesson M&P Shield. Which generation? Like the first one, second one? It's like the first gen. It has the little mag extender on it, so my because mm-hmm. I've got a bigger hand, so my uh, pinky fits on it, and that's a forty. Oh, nice with hollow points. Yep, I have a three sixty five uh, XL Romeo Zero Sig, so compact. It's really nice. And I think anything that you're gonna carry, you need to take it to the range frequently. Oh yeah. I mean, at least to me, like at least once a month. You should be putting some rounds to that so you're comfortable with it. And we were talking about this too a little bit. Know your house in the dark. Most of us do. Mm -hmm. But know what you would do if someone came into your house. Like, have a little bit of a plan. If you're gonna if you're set on having a gun in your house and you think you need to protect your family, then know what the fuck is going on in your house. Mm -hmm. Also, know that it's not just your kid fucking around. Be aware. When I took my concealed carry class, I think we've talked about it before. Yeah. My instructor, he said, you know, don't just have it on your nightstand. Have it in the drawer of your nightstand so it takes you a little more cognition to wake up and so you don't yeah. just grab it and start swinging around. You know what I mean? Because maybe your kid's having a nightmare and they're coming into your bedroom yeah. and next He's thing you know, you're fucking gunning yeah. your kid down. Yeah. You know, do something that takes a little cognition to get your gun. You know, That's and in your drawer point. is no different. It's, if it's in your drawer... You're talking like a second difference. I get it, but the chances it's have not changing. It's a, not going to change your survival rate at being in the drawer on your nightstand. No. Have you ever had a like a false alarm where you cleared your house? Um, I did hear a weird noise in my basement like two weeks ago. So I didn't clear my whole house, but I just went down. But I had no qualms with walking around my house with a gun because I don't have kids, so I know who the who's in my house. Yeah. You know, and when I left my bedroom, that means there's no one else in my house. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I've had I've had two instances. Uh the first one a couple of years ago, we're going to bed and I hear we have like paddle uh paddle door handles on our doors, right? And you know the sound of like someone like opening the paddle, right? Like on the you know, to get into your house, oh, yeah. turn yep. wrench it down, right? So <clears throat> I wake up to I sleep very uh, lightly, and I hardly sleep at all. And uh, I hear these this paddle like flipping. I'm like, "What the fuck is that?" And I I waited for a second. And I was like, "Let me just listen to that, make sure I heard it right." And I hear it going again. And I'm like, "Someone someone's trying to get my fucking house." 
So I grab my pistol and I go into the hallway. Lights are off. I do have a light on my pistol, but it was not engaged. And I'm just listening and I keep hearing it. And it's towards the back door. Like, uh, not the front. So, not the, like, coming down the stairs, the front door would have been to my left. It's the sounds coming to, to the back door. And I was like, what the fuck is that? So, and I don't see anybody at the door. But there's enough moonlight for me to kind of get in there. So, I do flick on the light and I'm clearing my room, right? I clear the, like, the playroom that's behind those barn doors. You've been in my place, right? Yep. And then I'm clearing, like, the living room. I pop behind the couch and I clean everything and I pop around the fucking corner where the island is, where the bar stools are at. And I thought somebody was down there. It was my Roomba that was flipped on its fucking top that was just going back and forth, like my vacuum, right? And it sounded like the paddles, but I was like, dude, for a second, I was very aware and very alert and very clear what was going on and I was very ready to shoot. Uh, but then I was kind of laughing at myself. And then I just, it's not like I couldn't sleep the rest of the night, but I was just like, wow, how you can go to zero to a thousand quickly and be engaged like that and have tunnel vision on what your pursuit is. Sure. And then I stopped, right? The other, the, were you naked? Yeah. Na- uh, com- uh, no, I was in silkies. You should just get naked. Yeah. Nobody wants to fight a naked guy. So you might not even need the gun. Oh, my uncle has a story about that. It's hilarious for another time. Oh, you and, your, you and hey, your, just so you know, if you're in here, I'm naked and I'm. <laughs> Ready and you're afraid. <laughs> I was. I just <laughs> naked and afraid. I had no. I were had you s- and your uncle wrestling naked? Because that's not okay. If you want to talk about that off yeah, off topic, let's hit stop. <laughs> mm. um, his story is hilarious. This guy knocked on his front door, and uh, he he opened like the guy like was knocking on it. My uncle's at the top of the stairs, and he didn't have any guns in his house. He had a baseball bat, and the guy ends up kicking his door in, and this dude is like in a trench coat with a machete. And he's, ta- and he's talking about how he's going to kill people and all this stuff. He was like LSD or whatever, right? So my uncle's there, naked, top of the stairs. And then he ends up getting the bat in the guy's face, and he talks to him. And he has him at the dining room table while his wife is calling the police to come over. And he's sitting there completely naked with a baseball bat, talking to this guy. The police show up. They come in the house, and he's still naked. And he's telling the, t- the cops what happened, and he's still fucking naked. <laughs> and then the cops like, "Sir, do you want to put on like anything?" He's like, "No, let me finish my story." <laughs> like, you know, just that's like, great. yeah, it's amazing. But uh, yeah, that's that shit'll wake you up at night. Have you? Um, our, we have an alarm that we turn on, and the alarm has one off before, and it's usually just something that. But when you hear the alarm go off, you're like, "Oh, yeah, it's time." You know, oh, yeah, 100%, <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, like, 100%. "Oh, yes." Yeah. But yeah, mo- that's pretty much. We have obviously three kids, so most of the time it's just them, you know, messing around. Yeah. And your giant dog. Yes, and our giant dog. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think overall, you should have a dog. By the way, I think everybody should have a dog. Yeah, or an aggressive that, cat. Mm. I think an aggressive cat to be aware. Than a dog sometimes. Yeah, yeah. but I, yeah, I think everybody's all you know, hot and heavy, ready to go. If I can get a gun, because there's constitutional dog, carry man. and. And dude, you know, here's still my advice. If you have your concealed carry permit, I would still keep it. I'm mm-hmm. going to keep mine. You're going to need some Agreed. kind of permit to purchase a weapon or yeah. rent a weapon anyway. So you might as well just fucking keep it. And not every state has constitutional carry, so it's not like there's reciprocity between the states. Mm-hmm. Just overall, though, please get some training. Just get some training. Oh, just some general Get some training. training. You should be at the range. Like I said, if you're going to have a gun in your house or on your person, be super comfortable with that gun. Shoot it frequently. And then uh, be realistic with yourself if you're actually prepared to use it. Yeah, that's the other thing, too. When that's you, a question. When you though, pull the gun, are you willing? Then that's a real question, trigger. not being weird. Yeah. Are you willing to kill someone? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you have to be okay with that. Because once you pull that trigger, whatever comes out is your responsibility. Because if you're not prepared, you just gave some a bad guy. Your gun. Your gun. And your family's in danger. Yes. So. If you're not prepared, not, I'm not saying everybody needs to own a gun. And if, if you're scared of guns... Just be honest with yourself. Just do what the bad yeah. guy says, and hopefully they don't kill you. Yes, be honest with yourself, and yeah. don't don't bring the only gun to the fight. And also remember that constitutional carry follows the same rules. If you're drinking, you no longer have the right to carry a gun. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's and you should still let the police know you're carrying. If you get pulled over, just let them know. Hey, just want to let you know I have a gun in the car. It's on me or it's wherever. I'm not going to make any sudden movements. 
You can hand them your driver's license and your permit. Here's my uh, here's yeah, my information. It would be great if you already had a concealed carry permit, you know. Yeah, because you can tell them that. And I mean, but just just be honest with them. Like I, I've said before, nobody likes gun violence. Cops aren't going out trying to shoot people. That's not their intention when they start their shift. Like, man, hope yeah. I get somebody I can fucking blast today. Yep. That's not you know that's not their intentions. So be smart. That's I mean we all have the right to bear arms. It's our constitutional God given rights, but you don't have the right to bear arms like a dipshit either. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So be smart about it and be confident. And like Chris said, get some training if you're not confident. There's plenty of places you can train in every city. Omaha, there's how many ranges now? Yeah, it's getting more and more. Whatever, frontier, yeah, whatever other cities are around here, you know, that people live in that listen to this, who knows? <laughs> but there, there's all somewhere you can get training. Yes, there's all kinds of just all kinds of places you can get training. And it's a great investment. For some training, you're going to invest in the firearm. You might as well invest in a little bit of training. Yeah, and they're fun. You know, guns are fun just to go shoot for fun anyway. Oh, yeah, they're mm-hmm. fun. So, anyway. What's, what's your favorite gun just at the range or outside to shoot? I mean, obviously, that you own. My Barrett is probably my. I have the M82A1. Oh, yeah, that's right. The semi auto, that's probably the funnest gun there is to shoot. I mean, you're just shooting. <laughs> Period. <laughs> that's just, <laughs> I mean, you have a, a 10 round magazine, you're just dropping $30 a magazine, and that's low end. That's probably feels good. That's steel ammo. Yeah, you're just shooting with freedom boners. That's all you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> but what about you? Do you do you just usually train I, on pistols? Yeah, pistols and rifle and AR. I my favorite is my rifle that I made myself that I take to the range and train with that. Which is that a Palmetto? No, it's just an Anderson lower, but lower doesn't really matter as long as you put good parts in it. You know, so that's that's what I I put it together myself, own barrel, Anderson lower, Anderson upper. It's just a really nice. Really nice rifle. And I, I'm obviously a little partial to it because I put it all together. Mm-hmm. So, obviously. Yeah. And it's built just for me. The way I, everything that I yeah. like is on it, you know, so it's. And, and you know, like you said, it's kind of a sentimental. Like, well, it's well, comfortable. Well, it's yeah. comfor- and that's what yeah. I'm talking about. You, once you have a gun, you've shot a lot, and you realize that you kind of put together the idea that this gun could save your life or somebody else's life, you do kind of get, it, and as weird as it sounds, you do get emotionally invested in a weapon. Like you'll have a certain oh, you, gun. I absolutely do. Like, yeah. Like my Springfield, I've had it forever, and it's you kind of get emotionally invested, and you're just like, you're like, man, I would get rid of any gun, but I'll never fucking get rid of this one. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you, you get to a point where it's like, because it's, it's, it's a, it can be a life saving device, and yeah. I know it sounds like super fucking weird, but anybody who's had a gun for a while, maybe it was gun handed down to them, you know what I mean? They're, they can be emotional investments. You know, one of the. <clears throat> Big metrics that is often discussed is I, I couldn't I couldn't give you the percentage, but of all of the people that have a concealed permit, it's like in the single digits of the percentage of them that actually habitually carry. So it's not many anyway. Yeah, not everybody carries, and, and you know what? It, it's always a hard deal because you don't ever want to not be like I don't carry all the time. I mean, I do ninety nine percent of the time. But I don't, and it always. I'm always like, God, I should because you know you never want to have that time where you're not carrying. And it's also situational, right? So if I'm going to downtown anywhere, well, and, and one, right? one second, not to interrupt you, but yeah, the constitutional carry, I assume, and maybe you guys know, but I assume it follows the same rules as the regular carry. And just because you don't have to take a fucking class, you cannot carry into a church. Oh yeah, you cannot carry same. into a federal building. Yeah, that's right. You know, you can't carry into like a law enforcement agency. So these are schools. School, yeah. So you, I mean, so just because you have to take a class, don't be a don't be a butt fuck. Like look at what yeah. it is because, yeah, no, I'm fucking to walk into the courthouse, pay my taxes with my fucking peace on. Okay. You know, th- again, th- like I said, if you can still carry correctly, yeah, no one should know you have it. I'm not saying you should take it into a federal building, but you forget. No one should know you have it anyway, if you're doing it correctly. Yep. But if you're gonna go in and it's imprinting real hard and it might be a bigger courthouse and they got a, uh, you know, they might have law enforcement on staff. They are going to fucking wrap you up because you just walked in with a loaded weapon into oh, yeah. a, a fucking federal building or a, uh, a local courthouse, any of those buildings. It's not. So yeah, go, go through a metal detector. This ain't the fucking, like, it ain't the fucking Wild West, dude. Just because you can carry it ain't yeah. the fucking Wild West. So I've got a, a friend. Uh, this was years ago when he was still in college. Uh, military friend of mine lives in Texas. They had open carry that was allowed on campus, right, in the college campus. And he had, uh, he's a leather worker, he's a blacksmith, and he's a big gun advocate, uh, really 
eclectic, intelligent dude, right? So he had his Cowboy Action 45. He made, like, a really cool leather holster for it. And it was, like, like uh, John Wayne. Uh, Ooh, with a hang down a little yeah, bit. Yeah, hanging down yeah. low. And uh, he, he could carry that into school. So legally, right? So he, he would start doing that as kind of a flag to bear on his political position to have conversations about gun rights and things like that. And he's one of those, and we all have those friends that want to talk about politics and they want to share what they know, and no matter the side, right? They just want to be involved in that conversation. Mm -hmm. And he, he loved the ability for that to start a conversation. But also remember, if you're the guy open carrying, you're the first guy to get shot. Yes. So this is wh why he ended up stopping is he got into so many conversations with students and teachers on campus about that, that it was too much attention on him and he does not want the attention. And he started to conceal again because it was too much of an issue. But again, the emotional intelligence of the decision to make to not do that, to continue to do that, he was like, this is making me uncomfortable now, but I want to carry. And if I'm uncomfortable when I carry, that's a bad decision I'm going to make. So he just started concealing, and nobody knew, and it was fine, right? So that's a decision you make. Like, uh, if you're again, if you're not comfortable carrying, and you want to, then train on it, practice with it, all those things. If you can't become comfortable even after the work, then just don't. Yeah, just don't hope that someone else is. Likely they are. Because that's a stat that I think is highly. Uh, not publicized is how many how many times a concealed carry person has stopped violent acts. Um, it's happened multiple times. Everybody wants to talk about just the the shitty violence that goes on in this country, but yeah, you know, people are going to kill people no matter. They're going to do it no matter if they want to do it. It's going to happen no matter what, and it's sad. You know, all these yep. shootings, but um, it's but a lot of times concealed carry holders have stopped a lot of things from escalating. So this is kind of a tangent, but uh, we all carry knives, right? Pocket knives, at least, right? Usually. Um, There's a good amount of people that do, sure. Mm. Yeah, good good amount. Uh, knife fighting, I don't think, is a skill that a lot of people have. And I'm not saying that I do, but Ed, yeah, he did when the, he was he here last year, he was Jeet talking about... Violence yeah. training. I'm just thinking, how brilliant is that to know how to fight with a knife? The guy that trains him, I've met him. He's a really cool guy, Mike Van Mike Van Beek. Uh, but yeah, he's he's a super cool guy. I mean, it, there's certain knives, certain styles, and things. But what a good skill! If you're not comfortable with a handgun, and you know, pocket knife can be pretty casual. Or right? pick up or pick up a martial art. Yeah, that too. Because I know some yeah, super bad dudes that are in martial arts that you might think you got the drop on them. Yeah. And it's game over because what's the what's the how many feet is it, Chris? When somebody's with twenty one feet, twenty one feet, they can get you before you can draw your gun. Uh -huh, it's like two seconds, isn't it? A second and a half, two seconds. It's knives are scary because first thing, they other things terrifying. about knives is they're it's way more personal, you know. Oh, you, stabbing someone is super personal. Yeah, it's way more personal. And then I got a new one. You you don't even know if somebody has it, right? I mean, you have no idea. Everybody carries a knife, so. You could probably be stabbed multiple times before you realize it. Because the adrenaline? Yeah. And if you're in a fight with someone, they could probably stab you, you know, 10 times before you realize you've been stabbed. And that's scary. Brutal. Yeah. yeah. So, knife I mean, wounds suck. Have you uh, ever had to help out with a knife wound? I, not that I can remember, no. I've never had to deal with the knife wounds. No. But, but I've bullet, heard some stories. There are lots of bullets. But yeah. I've heard some stories about. Knives are not, yeah, knives are scary. Uh, you know, overall, I'd say probably out of all this, just be smart and, and do what's best for you. If you don't feel comfortable, that's fine. There's no, there's no shame. Nobody said you have to, yep. have to do anything. But just do what's smart for you. And if you're going to carry, get some training to it. But, I mean, that's kind of our, that's kind of our opinions yep. on, on the, the knife situation and the gun situation. Do what's best for you. Get some training, and don't just like carry because you can and be a stupid asshole. Yep. So, any other Q and A's on there? I thought you were already doing some barbecue. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, nice. Uh, so I got a quarter of a cow recently, and we'll get a cow every uh, 
few months, maybe maybe every six months, we'll get a larger investment of a beef right in the house. So what I typically do is have most of it's ground beef because it's just easy for family stuff and tacos and burgers and just all that stuff. And the uh, the other thing that we started doing now is getting as many briskets and roasts as we can out of that alongside steaks and things. There's, um, only, there's only two briskets and a cow. But we'll get the <laughs> roast, right? We'll get the roast, <laughs> get some bone in and some bone, all that now, stuff. Now, when you do it, are you just ordering like a quarter of a cow like worth of meat? Like could you just get like four briskets and it equals whatever poundage? Will they let you do that? Uh, or no. you have to take the cuts that they... They'll give you an amount of... Yeah, they'll give you a certain amount. So you get the quarter. You get the quarter weight of the cow and the cuts you want. Yeah, and then the cuts you want. Yeah. So, uh, got what a, kind of cow is it? I couldn't tell you. Hmm. It's not a wagyu. Oh no, it's good old fashioned Nebraska beef. You know. Sure. How much? Um, is, how much does a quarter cow cost these days? So I was talking to Brad about that earlier. I was saying last. So for last year, the same experience. It was. Uh, I mean, it was like it was like five hundred and sixty bucks all in. How much? How much? And the poundage is quarter. So I don't know the poundage. I, yeah. I could tell you, but it's a quarter of a cow, whatever it was, right? Mm-hmm. And they're within the same wheelhouse. This time, it was eight hundred and ninety dollars. <laughs> That's how much it went up. Not even a wagyu. It's insane, but that I mean, it's crazy. It, it's it, it's really crazy, but it's still cheaper than getting beef from Costco and all that stuff. You know, I mean, it, it's amazing, but. Mm. So this weekend, we're having some family over, and um, I'm going to do a brisket, and then I'm also going to do uh, a chuck roast for that poor man's burn ends. Sure. And uh, I got the Texas Sugar. From Meat Church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I got that from Ace Hardware. They have an awesome selection of stuff. Ace Hardware she, has a lot of seasonings. Really Shields like also has a lot of seasonings. They do, Shields but it's, it's so far from my place. Oh, yeah, I guess you live. So it's like, you know, uh, all, you know, Ace has a bunch of, they've got barbecue sauce, they've got uh, all the seasonings, they've got all the all the devices, every type of Traeger you could ask for, then green eggs. Yeah, have, Ace Hardware I, I, does they, they weirdly do, have a really good selection. It's, it's really pretty impressive. Um, what are you going to be smoking this bad boy on? Traeger. Which one? Got a Which Costco, one? Got a I've got a, a tra- yeah. A it's Costco a, Traeger. Costco has like a an Their exclusive Traeger for them. Yeah, it's a Silverton six twenty. It looks like a gas grill. It does. Yeah, and his looks like a filthy gas grill because he he claims he cleaned, cleaned it. it but okay, so you know why I had to clean it? Because it caught on fire again. Yeah, because it's a fucking filth biscuit. So I caught I caught it on fire. I was uh, yeah. <laughs> Courtney's like, hey, the grill's on fire. She's like, it's really smoky. I'm like, yeah, smokers do that. Oh. And then and then I looked out there and I was like, yeah, the fucker's on fire. <laughs> so I, so I, uh, I had a client who had to fucking like put theirs out with a hose. Man, man I, did, sucks, I made the mistake of so I opened mad. I opened it up. You got to burp it, dude. Otherwise, it burns your eyelashes off. Exactly what happened. It's like a green egg, dude. If you don't burp your green egg, it, it burnt, will fucking it burn, burn your face hair. off. I had I had backdraft situation, you know, and it hit me. That's a great good. movie, by the way. I so are you not movie. changing the foil at the bottom of your Trigger? What's how do you how are you guys catching? Because I, I always change. I always change my foil. I'm not even let him answer. Okay. We were at his house last year, and dude, there wasn't a place there wasn't fucking grease on the outside of the lid, inside <laughs> of the fucking lid. <laughs> what is going the on? The fucking tray. You're gonna need one of those steam cleaners to get. It looks like you had like you know the greased up deaf guy from Family Guy just like rolling around on this fucking Trigger. It's it's it, that's why I'm so. Mike, ha- Mike has too much money. Obviously, he doesn't take care of his things. That's partially true. What is got a new one, babe? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's well, get rid of this thing. <laughs> this thing sucks. <laughs> Throw by, <laughs> by the it curb. Stopped, put free stopped. on it. Yeah, it stopped working. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Uh, Keeps catching on fire. Piece of shit. Anyway, so <laughs> I went and got a new one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so it does look like a gas grill. It's uh. It's nice because it has a rack. Um, it's not really sophisticated or anything, but it's it's pretty simple. It's it's not it's not huge, but it's good for us. And um, it's Wi Fi though. The wire Mine, fi- mine's Wi Fi too. The wire fire and it's it, cool. it is so cool. Like you know, changing temperatures, turning it off, even you know all that stuff. Like, yeah. Yeah. Lazy super- lazy man oh, smoking. It. Yeah, it's oh, the, I better drop the temperature. It's the brisket misfit is the name. Oh, mine's uh like as in the band. Mine was baby got brisket. 
It was one oh, of the ones nice. I had. It was like yeah. one of the pre You had to choose them, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> mine was Baby Got Brisket. That's I think I just cool. call mine Smoky. Or no, no, you know what? I think I had to rename it. It says Lord of the Smoke Ring. Oh, mm. that's incredible. I think that's what mine is Way now. to go. Yeah, they have like a is sign. Is it a custom name? name? No, it was one of the ones I had you could pick from. You can do a custom name, can't you? I thought you could. I'm yeah, I think I, I thought you could, that. but I just picked yeah. Lord of the Smoke Ring. I'm gonna have to well, change brisket mine now. Misfit to get real was, was creative perfect. with it. What's yours? Mine's just Smoky. I'm gonna have to get real creative with it. So, yeah, cool. Everyone's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's smoker's name Smoky. Yeah, I guess I, I'm gonna have to you, come up with. Hey, something. you could awesome. call yours Grease Fire. It's <laughs> there. You go. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why that's more funny than it should have been. Um, oh man! So, uh, let's see. Where was it? Okay, you're making a brisket. You're making poor man's burn ends. You and got I, Texas sugar. Yep, and I'm and you clean the grill. I'm, my and I and I supposedly. Did clean it. So I did. Okay. It's far less embarrassing. Rumor has it. Rumor has it. Uh, the brisket and chuck roast all cook at the same time, same temperature. Until I pull the brisket, and then I'll you know turn up the heat a little bit, do the burn ends on the chuck roast. Why if you're doing a brisket, why don't you do the burn ends off the brisket instead of doing a chuck it's roast? It's not it's not a big brisket. That's why you don't buy quarter cows for the briskets because they're not very big. Uh, exactly. Yeah. How um, big is it? Twelve. No, I bet it's not even. I bet it's like six or eight. Does it have a oh, point? Man. Does it even have a point on it, or is it just the flat? No, it doesn't have a point. Yeah, a lot yeah. of times the brisket's off a cow like that. Mm. They trim it down. Yeah, it's it's small. It's 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 uh if it's stacked on top of the roast. It's like the same size, and it's I'd, I'd say it's eight pounds. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so my what you are should just buy a full brisket from Costco. This will be easier. Just buy a full brisket from Costco and make actual burn ends like a man would, because mm. you're not poor. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm mm. lazy. You oh you gotta drive to Costco. It's so far from my house. It's not that. Far. And then what you do is so when you're smoking your brisket, you wrap not. it. I assume you wrap it with paper, but maybe use foil because of the Texas crutch. I do that. Foil? Yep. So when it gets to your 200, whatever, pull it quick, slice the point off, wrap it back up to rest, and then slice your point up into fucking burn ends. I love burn ends. I might have to do that. Yeah, I use real ones and save your Create the volume. Here's my question, though. Still do so, the Chuck Texas, so, uh, the I do. Chuck Rose poor man's burn ends are pretty good. Yeah. Though. They, they're great. Yeah. I do the. the uh, Chris has never done a brisket, by the way, so his right. opinion's pretty void. <laughs> okay. I'm turning my chair. <laughs> so, scared. I'm scared. I'll do the Texas sugar. I'll put it on there, cook it appropriately, right temperatures, blah, blah, blah. But I'm curious if I could add, like, bourbon to it. Because I've done this with a pulled pork, and I know it's fattier, and it was really great. How did you add the bourbon to it? I just would, um, as it was wrapped, I'd just pour it on top of it and kind of close it in so it'd steam it with the... But you're going to start to lose your bark. Oh, if you get too much moisture, you'll start to lose your bark. Really? You Maybe could do, you could spritz it, like, you know. Yeah, while you're cooking it, you could yeah, spritz, spritz it. Yeah, spritz it with bourbon instead of apple cider I just do, you know, the big full but size. But wouldn't it dry it out? Because I thought you or you no, said that I injected before. it, and it, I thought it fucked it up. Mm. Okay. But I use the big full-size pans. What are those called? Catering pans? What are they called? The full-size pan. Aluminum pan. And I put water and... You can put water and bourbon in that pan so it cooks with it the whole time and permeates into it. That's a good idea, too. Just Are you it, putting the pan there. underneath the brisket? Yeah, do you have a top shelf that a brisket fits on? Yeah. So I, I season my brisket in that pan, blah, blah, whatever, season it. I oh, put it on okay. that top rack, fat side up, because that's the best way to do it, because otherwise it's just competition style. Put my pan underneath it. I put probably 64 ounces of water, and I put like three shots of Crown Royal Maple in there. Oh, nice. And then I let that cook that way. So, Okay. Not injecting it, not spraying it, just using that. Well, and then I wrap okay. it between 165 and 175. I wrap it in paper like like a real barbecue guy would. Again, lazy. Yeah. Well, foil will cook it faster because it steams it. But you okay. can lose part of your bark. Okay. If you're looking for the bark on top. I do like the bark. So How long do you rest yours for? How long do you rest that one that was so what did, I think it was, uh, what do you, brown sugar and butter? No that butter, just brown sugar. Right? Brown I use, sugar. I use salt, pepper, garlic, and, and then you I do use brown sugar. Fat side up. Fat side up. Like, fat side yeah, up. God's way. God. Well, so the whole time, yeah. right? Is the whole it, time. Okay. All right. Cool. Most people do, do meat side up is like a competitive way to do it because you get a better smoke ring. But it's I more think, delicious if fat side's up. I think fat side up, and that's like Matt Pittman does fat side up. Then I'm doing that. That's the way. I like it. I've done it both ways. I like it fat side up better. Um... But I usually rest it in a cooler with the lid cracked for like, depends on how much time you have. If you plan it out right, 
for like an hour, lid open for an hour, set it on the counter, but I leave my probe in it the whole time so I can watch the temp, and then I start slicing it at like 155. So you're talking over two hours of it resting. Longer than that, yeah. You can hold it. If you keep Damn. it in the cooler cracked, you can hold it in that cooler for probably five, six hours. But I don't even want to wait that long. That's a problem. Yeah, but you got to give time for it to pull the moisture back in for the meat to tighten up. So it'll pull all that juice back in. Chris has had mine. It's worth it. Well, it I've is, had your, your brisket. It's great. It. Yeah. I was bent. I, I think I mentioned this on this on this podcast a couple times ago. But I was benching, and he comes over here like a like wait, a waiter. waitress up here serving me up brisket in the middle of bench session. It's great. <laughs> Brett's, have, made, Brett's made so many briskets. He used to bring it for lunch, and I'm like oh, I'm kind of tired of eating brisket. I do get tired. We've, <laughs> dude, you can <laughs> yeah. you can make a brisket all day, and all you want to do is go to Wendy's. That's that's disgusting. But I've done but it. Brisket right off the floor. Yeah, but let it rest for a while. If you don't have the time, that long though. Now, if you don't have the time, you know, so you can total put it on the counter. Time. What do you? I mean, so what? My but it's going to go. He's got a small brisket. So. That six pound one. Fuck, I think probably done in like four hours. Yeah, I figure because so, there's no fat in it. Then you don't have to if, worry about the. I'm going to be honest. Time. To be real honest, that brisket's probably going to be terrible. You think so? There's not a fat in it. It's a little small brisket. Well, I'll take a. I'll send you a picture when. when is there I, a bunch of white marbling in it? I haven't even opened it up yet. I, I've had briskets off a guy like that, and they're not very good. Hmm. I mean. Not trying to be an asshole, like, but like, if you're gonna buy a brisket, like, spend the money and get a good brisket. That's well, the if, you're, that's if you're gonna put so with, that's so the that's problem with today, honesty is not being an asshole. Okay. Yeah, it is. No, if no, you tell, so like <laughs> I was telling you, if you're telling the truth, you're not being an asshole. It's not <laughs> gossip, but you tell the truth. The yeah. uh, the the thing is, is that the brisket was kind of like a. Uh, I would grind that brisket for hamburger. That's what they offered, but I said no. Just do it yourself. You got a meat grinder? No. Do you, you, have a, a you, got a, you got a kitchen aid? I don't have enough money for a kitchen aid. Get the fuck out here! Yeah. So you have a kitchen aid? Not a meat, not a like a regular one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you can, can buy the meat grinder, hundred yeah. bucks. Get the no. metal one. Don't get the fucking plastic one. Get the actual KitchenAid metal one. Anybody? How who has, does that even work? It plugs into the front of it. You pull that front cork out. It hooks in there. And you stuff it in there. And anybody who has a meat grinder that's metal, you keep the parts in the freezer. That way, yeah. And you oh, you keep your brilliant. meat needs to be cold, almost frozen. Then it doesn't gum up and it grinds better. I paid for a sausage class to learn that. Did you do? <laughs> do you double grind yours? I don't. You don't. I do you don't think there's grind? any? The, to make it rope more fine, is that? Yeah. To make okay. it, um, I don't like because I feel like brisket turns like mushy after if you double grind it. So here's the funny part: I took a sausage class, and the guy's like a like a, a savant sausage maker mm. from up in uh, Fort Calhoun, Irvington, whatever area. He uh, was talking about when they make hot dogs, that has to be double grind and refrozen. And he goes, "And all you get are hot dogs." Just remember that. <laughs> Damn. And sausage making is very like. Have you made sausage? Wait, hold before? on, time out. Back to my brisket I did in, real quick because of the weekend. So, am I good with Texas sugar on that thing? Yeah. Okay. Do I need to do anything else? No, I mean, you use any kind of binder. I like to use a binder. What do you mean? Like mustard. Or like I use Okay, hot, I'll I use, do. Yeah, I use like Traeger hot sauce as a binder. Yeah, I'll do, I'll do mustard and then that, and that's all I was planning on doing. But I remember, I think if you look at like Cosmos has a thing, Cosmos barbecue. He has good seasonings, by the way, if anybody wants to try some different stuff. Um, I think he said for a brisket, you should use a half a bottle to season it. Half a bottle, uh, of just salt and pepper, it. or what? Well, he just saying. Do, he just saying his seasoning. Salt and pepper, like the ones that like, like. I use Cosmos SPG, which is salt, pepper, garlic. Yeah. So what I do is I use Traeger hot sauce as a binder. Nice. I use SPG over it, and then I use brown sugar on mine. I always buy Malcolm stuff because I'm trying to support him. So for when he dies and his family has money, I do like Malcolm. Malcolm is doing very well yeah. for himself. Tell me, tell me the brown sugar thing at the end. I put brown sugar on it before I put it on the smoker. So you season it with whatever you're going to season. Is brown sugar too much for Texas sugar? You think? Well, I mean, don't get all crazy. Just try a recipe and see what you like. I mean, I fucked up a lot of briskets to figure out something that I liked. Man, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to. I'm not being crazy. That's I would. I know, honestly, I would just go to Costco and buy a brisket. That brisket's going to suck balls. <laughs> I wouldn't even cook it. <laughs> I'm just being real. I've made just, one. Just grind it. In I'm, I'm, dude, I'm just being what real. What are you doing on Saturday? I've come over here and put my meat in your mouth. I'm just being real. It's probably, anyway, it's probably not going to be good. Malcolm from How to Barbecue Ride. Malcolm does have good. Malcolm's but his, the man. His Watch offer, his videos. His yeah. AP, Malcolm does love to eat. Yeah. His AP is very garlicky compared to Cosmo salt, pepper, garlic, though. Is it? Yeah, it's I his. guess I don't know. I, I always buy his AP stuff. Yeah, it so. is good. Yeah. Malcolm makes good stuff. Cosmos yeah. make good stuff. Meat Church. These are some seasonings people don't... I just go to Hy-Vee and I buy fucking whatever. And you can get some of the stuff at Hy-Vee now. There is some stuff at Hy-Vee, but mm. try How to Barbecue Right or Killer Hogs. Killer Hogs is the brand. There might be some meat church stuff at Walmart now. There's some I'm, meat church stuff at Hy-Vee. Wrong. I, I could be wrong, but. Um, if you just want a basic meat church one that's good on everything, get Honey Hog. 
So you can put honey hog on everything. You can just put honey hog in your hand and fucking lick your hand. And I like the spicy one. I can't think of what it was called. It's hot, hot, hot honey hot, hog. Yeah. I did some ribs in the, or the, no, voodoo, the voodoo. The holy voodoo. voodoo. I did ribs in voodoo. Oh. The gospel one's delicious too. I kind of mixed it up though. I did. Uh, I don't all, know. That's his all purpose though. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. I use the voodoo for the ribs, but I use Malcolm's rib recipe to where he puts so voodoo on the ribs, and then Malcolm uses brown sugar, his vinegar. Oh, so I don't, I don't wrap my. You wrapping yours then? Yeah, vinegar sauce and the butter. Yep. And then I wrapped them. They were, uh, they were good. I used to make the full yeah. racks of ribs. That's what. Yeah. Okay. You get them from but Costco, then they're coming threes. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. But I trim them down. I changed them and now I slice them and wrap them with bacon because of him. Those are good too. Bacon wrapped ribs. And they right? cook faster. What are those things? What are those things you make with the bacon wrapped? Pick uh, shots. Yes. That's also a meat trick recipe. What is? But what do you? Okay. So you take like a sausage. Like we get chicken sausages because. Amber likes those. I'm trying to get lean. I get so it. they're pre-cooked. Yeah. Basically, you cut you cut them in like quarter inch, maybe a little thicker slabs. Wrap them in a half a piece of bacon, and then it's a mixture of like cream cheese, cream cheese, shredded cheese, diced green peppers, um, or those little diced chili peppers. You know the green ones in a can yeah. or whatever. And then whatever seasonings you're doing, and you put that in the middle of it, and then you fucking smoke it. Mm-hmm. And don't eat the toothpick. You have to put a toothpick through it to hold it together through the sausage and the bacon. Is that what you brought to my house like that? Those? Yeah. Yep. But Meat so, Church has tons of great recipes and a YouTube, so check out Meat Church's page. Uh, check out How to Barbecue Right. He's got a ton of good stuff. Cosmos has good stuff. Cosmos with a K. Um, he doesn't put out as many videos as he used to, but he's got some really good seasonings. The fatter, the better. The, the cook. Oh, and Malcolm's. Uh, I mean, yeah. But Meat Church, Matt Pittman's not he's, that. Yeah, he's pretty normal. But looking. Malcolm's. And we've said before, <laughs> Pittman stuff is great. He gives you time and temperature. Sometimes it's not the same, so watch your shit, though. I think anybody, here's my thing. My biggest tip, anybody wants to get into barbecue or smoking, temperature's right, time is fucked up, I think. But if you're going to smoking, oh. spend, if you're going to spend some money, buy good probes. Like Thermalworks makes like an Insta-read, get one of those. As soon as you touch it to the meat, it'll tell you what the fucking temperature is of it. And you can check tenderness with it. Yeah, also, your probes. Glides in there. Yeah. Also, your leave-in probes, get good ones, because you don't want to fuck your $80 brisket up. Or that free thing that you got that's probably going to taste like cat shit this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I think the probes on the Traegers work good as long as you... I just make sure you, cal- make sure you calibrate too. it. Calibrate it, though. And there's instructions on how to calibrate it. I didn't know that. Like, yeah, you got to calibrate it. Well, yours is so filthy, it probably doesn't even work anymore. It's like... A, Wait, how do you cal- how do you do that? Really? You get some really? ice water with some salt in it, so and then you... It's obviously going to be whatever temperature that is. You know what I mean? It's like a... No shit. And then you it, whatever it reads, then you can adjust it Four degrees up or down. Oh, it's to you have it, to stick the clothespin in it, right? Yeah, then you got to you. So you got to calibrate the one that your, comes with the trigger that you plug yes. in. It. Oh, Make sure you calibrate. There's a little thing. sticker. There's a little tiny hole, and you stick a fucking paperclip, and then you can hit a button, and you can change it up or down. Oh, I had no idea. Mine, mine, you don't have to do that. I think you just change it. Mine has it on the program thing where you can calibrate oh. the the probe. I'm gonna open my app right now. And take Another it. little tip: if you want to find the hot spots on your trigger or any smoker, get some Grand's biscuits and lay them across the racks. And see how they cook. Yep. And your burn ones are your hot spots. I that's can a, tell you the good, back uh, left part of good, mine is that's a good tip. A hot zone. Yes. Yours is always hot because so, it's on fire. <laughs> so and then for a brisket, <laughs> speaking of briskets, if you have a hotter side, always put the thicker side of the brisket to the hotter side. Okay. Unless yep. there's an airflow thing. If you have an offset in your airflow, you want your airflow to come up over the top of the brisket. That's why you see these guys talking about making their briskets aerodynamic. So air doesn't get caught up coming over it. Mm. Airflow is huge. Brett's definitely uh Way above the knowledge level of us on 100%. the whole. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I no. mean, even if it does taste like shit, I will just dip it in barbecue sauce and eat it. So you should be able to brisket with no. Bar- I've never put barbecue. Uh, sauce I don't. On mine. I won't. Have either. you had barbecue sauce in my brisket? No, no. no and I, I, I haven't even on mine. But I, you know, it's edible. Yeah, it I mean, if edible. you know what, at least your wife can make a good cake. You got that going for you. <sighs> she does. She make does make a good, a good cake. Hey, I know. The, I noticed the uh, smokers on fire again, but I got this cake, so we're yeah, good. Who yeah. cares? Yeah, it's fine. Angel food cake, baby. Let's get. We're it. good to go. All right, guys. I want to thank everybody for listening. If you like it, share it. You know what? Go out and uh, you know download us. Set us on auto download. It helps us out. Go give us a five star rating on uh, Apple I- or Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you like it, share it. Tell your friends. If you don't like it, we don't really give a fuck. Just share it anyway. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Next week, um, next Friday, we'll be recording with the legend himself, Ed Cohen. Will be here, so we'll be recording with him. So. This one, uh, this episode will be out Wednesday. We'll record with Ed next Friday. Appreciate you guys. Thanks. Bye.